Good evening. Thank you for joining us tonight. My name is John Fleider, and I serve on the Lou Douglas Lecture Series Committee. On behalf of the committee, I'd like to welcome you to the final Lou Douglas Lecture of the fall 2001 semester. The Lou Douglas Lecture Series on Public Issues is sponsored by the UFM Community Learning Center, founded to honor the memory of distinguished professor of political science, Lou Douglas. The series deals with topics pertaining to human rights, social justice, world peace, and international development. The fall 2001 series is dedicated to Mary Douglas, widow of Professor Douglas. Mrs. Douglas was a teacher, community activist, and a patron of this series for many years. She passed away last December. Our speaker tonight is Dr. Steffi Woolhandler. Dr. Woolhandler is an associate professor of medicine at Harvard University. She is also co-founder of the Physicians for National Health Program, an organization which advocates a single-payer system of national health insurance in the United States. That will be the focus of her lecture tonight. Dr. Woolhandler will be introduced by Linda Tiener, who is the executive director of the UFM Community Learning Center and also a member of the Lou Douglas Lecture Series Committee. Uh, this lecture series is a community effort. Our thanks go out to President Weefald, Provost Kaufman, various university colleges and departments, student government association, faculty members, and many local citizens whose contributions support the series. Uh, special thanks to all those members of the Manhattan Alliance for Peace and Justice who wrote letters to the editor of the Manhattan Mercury uh, discussing the need for national health care program, national health insurance program. After the lecture, there will be a question and answer period. We encourage you to stay and participate for the question session. And there are also some books available for purchase in the lobby. Thank you. Good evening. Tonight's Lou Douglas lecture is about health insurance. And you know, if you're young, if you're healthy, um, if you have health insurance coverage, you don't think a lot about health insurance. But if you don't, or if you need to see a doctor, or you need some medicine, or you have to have tests, or even worse, if you have to go to the hospital, suddenly health insurance becomes a very important factor in your life. I'm going to give you some perspective on this from a very personal angle. In August, my husband had a heart attack. Very um, out of nowhere, um, very surprising to all of us, to say the least. The ambulance that took him to the hospital cost us over $3,000. The helicopter that flew him to Topeka cost more than $7,000. The emergency room was a couple of thousand here or there. The hospital stay in Topeka was $112,000 for two and a half days. Medication that he's taking now costs over $700 a month. We have health insurance. And because we do, the insurance company was able to negotiate with all of these vendors a savings of $102,000. So actually, the insurance company paid $28,471 out of what? $100 $50,000 bill. We paid $1,358 out of that bill ourselves. Of the medications, insurance pays $527 and we pay $178 a month, or we did. But actually, the rest of this year, we get all of our medications and most of our regular hospital care free because we reached our catastrophic limit. Uh, lucky us. Now, think if you didn't have health insurance. Eh, if we didn't have health insurance, I might not have called the ambulance. I might have thrown him in the car and hauled him to the hospital myself, assuming that my car was running and I had gas. Or maybe we would have sprung for the ambulance, but we sure wouldn't have sprung for the Life Star helicopter to fly him to Topeka. Uh, we would have stayed in Manhattan 
for health care. He would not have gotten the kind of, of heart specialist care that he got in Topeka because they don't have it here. But we couldn't have afforded what we were able to take advantage of because we have health insurance. At least 15 to 20 percent of Kansans don't have health insurance. Many others, including those on Medicare uh, or those who have health insurance but can't afford the copay, they can't afford some of the services, they can't afford medications uh, that are needed to take care of themselves. Tonight's lecture, a national health program for the United States, will be presented by Dr. Steffi Woolhandler. Dr. Woolhandler grew up in Louisiana, and after receiving her Bachelor's of Arts degree from Stanford University, she completed her MD at Louisiana State University in New Orleans, and her Master's degree in Public Health at the University of California, Berkeley. Dr. Woolhandler has been a National Health Services Research Fellow in General Internal Medicine at Harvard Medical School, a Robert Wood Johnson Health Policy Fellow in the Institute of Medicine, the National Academy of Sciences, and has twice received the Teacher of the Year Award from Boston University School of Public Health. Dr. Woolhandler's work has been published in numerous journals, including the Journal of American Geriatrics, American Journal of Public Health, the New England Journal of Medicine, the Lancet, Journal of the American Medical Association, the International Journal of Health Services, and the Annals of Internal Medicine. In addition, she is the author of over 25 books, book chapters, and monographs. Today, Dr. Will Handler practices primary care internal medicine at Cambridge City Hospital and also teaches at Harvard, where she's an associate professor of medicine. In 1986, she co-founded Physicians for a National Health Program, which advocates a single-payer single -payer system of national health insurance for the United States. Dr. Wilhandler lives in Cambridge, Massachusetts with her family. May I present Steffi Wilhandler. Uh, well, gee, Linda, I want to thank you for that long introduction, but it did remind me a little bit about the old story about Eleanor Roosevelt, who apparently hated long, flowery introductions, um, and actually told people introducing her to, you know, keep it short. So uh, one woman introduced her and said, this is Eleanor Roosevelt, and the less said about her, the better. <laughs> okay, okay uh, this is a chart from the hospital where I did my training in Oakland, Berkeley, California. It was a public hospital. Um, and it's a chart of a 59-year-old gentleman who was in an automobile accident. Uh, he had what's called a depressed skull fracture, where the skull was like pushed in to the brain. He had brain and bone sticking out of his head wound. Um, he was taken to an HMO's hospital where he had a negative wallet biopsy. Okay, negative wallet biopsy, no insurance card found. So he was placed in an ambulance with no doctor or nurse there and transferred to the hospital where I was working. Now, when we, he got there, we discovered he had a broken neck in addition to his head wound. Um, took him to neurosurgery and, and he did pretty well. Only four days later, that HMO discovered that they'd made a mistake. He, in fact, had health insurance. And they demanded and won his transfer back to the HMO's hospital. Okay. So I bring you this case um, to talk about the two types of disadvantaged people in our health care system. There's the traditional disadvantaged, who this man was mistakenly believed to be, that is, people who have no health insurance or only partial coverage. And then there's the new disadvantaged, people who have health insurance, but their health insurance f fails them when they're expensively ill. The insurance is simply not there. There's so many restrictions that it interferes with them getting the care that they need. And of course, that's true with many HMO patients in our current health care system. Okay. Now, the traditional disadvantage, 39 million uninsured Americans. Uh, there's 39 million in the year 2000. I can guarantee you that in the year 2002, we're going to have a much higher number of uninsured Americans because, of course, the economy is heading south. And when the economy goes down, people lose their jobs, lose their insurance. And even people who hold on to their jobs often find that their employers cut back on insurance coverage. So you don't need to be a psychic to predict that we're going to see 
see a huge uptick, a huge upswing in the number of uninsured people uh, over the next few years. Okay. Uh, I can also guarantee you that the health care policy debate is going to be reopening. It's been relatively quiescent since the early 90s, um, and I can guarantee it's about to reopen. Is that, am I saying that because the number of uninsured is going up? Well, not really. Uh, the thing that's going to be driving debate is going to be the issue of health care costs. Uh, in the early 90s, health care costs were going up rather rapidly. We had a big debate about health care reform. In the mid-1990s, in fact, health care costs were relatively level. Corporate America was pretty happy with the situation and wasn't very interested in health care debate. But as we enter the year 2002, health care costs are really on the upswing, um, and it's projected that we will have double-digit increases uh, in 2001, 2002. So because health care costs are going up at the same time that we anticipate a rise in the number of uninsured, I can tell you that health policy reform debate will be reopening in the next few months. But let's get back to talking about the issue of the uninsured. Uh, young adults, 18 to 24, that's most of the people in the audience, you are the folks with the highest rates of uninsurance. 27% of people in your age group have no health insurance. Uh, and, but virtually every age group except the over 65 uh, does have a substantial percentage who have no health insurance. Of course, people over the age of 65 are virtually all eligible for the Medicare program. But it would be a mistake to look at statistics like this and say, gee, everybody who, has, who lacks health insurance is healthy. Why worry about people? You know, it's, it's just a bunch of young adults who don't have health problems. That would be a mistake because when we look at people with serious illnesses, we find substantial numbers of them have no health insurance. So, for instance, there's three quarters of a million people in this country who have diabetes and have no health insurance. Okay. There's uh, two million people who have elevated cholesterol, no health insurance. Two and a half million people with high blood pressure, no health insurance. Obviously, these people are simply not going to be able to get the care that they need. Uh, that's been documented. Uh, this and the previous slide were from a study carried out by the American College of Physicians. It's the, the professional group that I belong to. It's the internal medicine professional group. But uh, this slide really just shows the obvious. Their study just found the obvious. That is, if you have no health insurance, you're less likely to get medical care. Uh, you don't get your mammogram. You don't get your pap smear. You don't get your blood pressure screening, your eye exams, your foot exams, your cholesterol screening. Uninsured people simply don't get the care. And again, not surprisingly, uninsured people are much more likely than other people to experience a deterioration in their health status. So people with insurance are in blue, yellow is intermittently uninsured, pink is continuously uninsured, and people who are continuously uninsured were much more likely than other people to experience a major health decline, and in this age group, which was a 51 to 61 age group, to experience new trouble in walking. So again, stating the obvious, you don't have health insurance, it's not good for your health. Similarly, when we look at avoidable hospitalizations, hospitalizations that should have been prevented by good primary care, hospitalizations for things like asthma attacks, uh, we find avoidable hospitalizations actually rising in the United States over the past few years as more and more people find themselves unable to get the primary care that could prevent those problems. And this is a major interest of mine, uh, medical bankruptcy. I just was wondering, who in this room knows someone who has experienced medical bankruptcy? Okay, a few people. The rest of you who didn't put up your hands are wrong. I think that everyone in this room knows someone who's experienced medical bankruptcy. You just don't know about it. If we put 1,000 people in this room, and that'd be all the seats and all the aisles, but we put 1,000 people in this room, um, five to seven of those people would declare medical bankruptcy in the next year. Okay. In any given year, five out of a thousand men, seven out of a thousand women declare medically related bankruptcy. Nearly half a million people a year in the United States have a bankruptcy related to medical illness or medical bills. 
but they don't tell their friends about it. They definitely don't tell their doctors about it. Many of them don't even tell their own children about medical bankruptcy. Uh, we're currently studying medical bankruptcy, and in addition to finding that about half of all bankruptcies in the country are due to medical bills, uh, we're finding that most people who declare medical bankruptcy had health insurance. Okay, most people had health insurance, primarily a problem of people with health insurance, but because of gaps in their coverage, things that aren't covered, still being driven into bankruptcy. Which brings us to the issue of underinsurance, or only partial coverage. In addition to the 40 million or so Americans who have no insurance whatsoever, there's at least that many more who have grossly inadequate coverage, who have only partial coverage, such that they would be bankrupted by a major illness. Uh, in my own practice, this is the most common problem with insurance that I face is underinsured senior citizens. As I mentioned earlier, virtually all senior citizens have Medicare, but Medicare pays only about half of the health care bills of seniors, and the other half is paid out of pocket. So it turns out that currently seniors are spending about 25% of their total income on health care. If the current Medicare law stays in effect by the year 2025, the average senior citizen will be spending more than a third of their income on health bills despite the existence of Medicare. And if President Bush has his way and goes to a system called premium support, a kind of voucher system where the government gives the senior a voucher and then they have to go and buy their own insurance with that voucher, if Bush's plan is enacted by the year 2025, the average senior citizen will be spending over 40% of their income on health care bills. Um, but when we talk about the problem of partial coverage, um, it's a really much bigger problem than even that, and many of you in this room are underinsured for mental health care. I dare say that if any of us developed a serious mental illness, we would find that our health care coverage was woefully inadequate. And I give you the evidence for this. This is a survey of over 5,000 primary care doctors who were asked, are you always able to get the mental health care that your patients need? And less than a third of primary care doctors said that they were all, all, always or almost always able to get all the, health, the mental health care that their patients need. Um, and again, this is a problem in my own practice. I'm actually a very aggressive person. I call up the HMOs and fight with them all the time about my patients. And I'm almost always able to get the physical health needs of my patients met, even very expensive physical health needs. But even I find that when my, my patients have serious mental health problems, that their insurance fails them, that they're simply not able to get the care that they need to get back to their optimal level of functioning. And this translates into tremendous suffering, and I just want to talk about this particular issue, financial suffering at the end of life. Uh, this is data from the support study, which is this big study that's looked at end of life care, care of dying people. Uh, in the support study, virtually all of the patients did have health insurance, and yet when they queried dying people and their families, was the cost of caring for your permanently ill family member a moderate to severe problem? Nearly 40% of these insured people said that it was a, a moderate to severe financial problem providing care for their dying relative. And more than a fifth of families that had to um, use more than 10% of total family income for care of the dying person. And in 12% of families, people had to sell an asset, take a second mortgage on their home, have a kid drop out of college, take on a second job, make major financial sacrifices to care for the person who was dying. And sadly, among people who reported that their illness was a moderate to severe financial burden for their family, uh, those people were much more likely than other people to say that they wanted their life to be ended early because they were such a burden to their family. Okay. Tremendous suffering related to health care finance in this country. Uh, down to a more mundane issue of financial coverage for prescription drugs. Virtually every other nation has health insurance that covers prescription drugs. 
okay, virtually every other nation. Uh, and they've been able to afford it because by having a national health insurance program that covers prescription drugs, the government has been able to use its buying power to get lower prices so that in the rest of the world, people buy the exact same drugs that we have here in the United States but pay about one-third less for those drugs because they have national health insurance that covers them. Okay. What does this mean in terms of our outcomes? What does this mean in terms of how our citizens do in their health? Well, American women live two to three years shorter than women in other developed nations. And similarly, when we look at life expectancy for men, uh, men in the United States live two to three years shorter lives than men in other countries. Uh, when we look at our life expectancy, our death rate per thousand life births is much higher than the rest of the developed world. Now, how bad is an infant mortality rate of seven per thousand? How does that really compare to the rest of the world? Well, this is just how bad it is. Because in this slide, I've taken the Canadian infant mortality rate and divided it by income quintiles so that the wealthiest fifth of the population is over here on the left and the poorest fifth of the population is there in blue on the right. And it turns out that the average infant mortality rate in the United States is higher than the infant mortality rate for the poorest quintile of people in Canada. Okay, that's how bad infant mortality statistics are. When you query Americans about difficulty getting the care that they need, Americans are the most likely of any English-speaking country to say they have problems getting needed care. And that's not a, a mistake. 28% of the American people find that it's extremely difficult, extremely very or somewhat difficult to get care when they need it. Okay. Um, it's uh, common to say in the United States that we have the world's greatest health care system. Perhaps that's true, but I think it's also true to say that we have the world's worst health care finance system. Uh, in no other system is a finance system so much of an impediment to care. Um, and I, I teach at Harvard Medical School, and I spend a lot of my time with medical students. Uh, and I tell them that you're going to learn lots of wonderful things you're going to be able to do for your patients, lots of ways that you can help your patients. And you're also going to learn that the financing system is going to block you, uh, constantly be blocking you from doing the wonderful things that you can do to help people. And that's really what this slide means. Now, this would be perhaps justifiable if we had this terrific scientific enterprise that was unparalleled. And certainly, the pharmaceutical industry would like us to believe that the level of science in the United States is in some ways unique. Yet, when you look at our scientific output on a per capita basis, we're really middle of the pack. This is looking at medical journal, journal articles per capita, uh, with the US really middle of the pack or worse when it comes to medical journal output on a per capita basis. Slightly different database, scientific articles per capita, and again, the United States is down toward the bottom of the developed world. So we can't justify the healthcare system that we have on the basis of scientific output if we look at that issue objectively. Now, what's going on here? Where are healthcare dollars going, and why is the financing system so corrupt? Um, and to talk about that, we're going to have to talk about the business aspect of health care. We're going to have to talk about the economic aspect of health care. I actually have a degree in economics. And uh, my friends, when they really want to tease me, make the joke that an economist is someone who didn't have the personality to become an accountant. But we're going to have to have a lot of numbers here and a lot of economics. Because in order to understand where healthcare is going in this, uh, in this day and age, you have to understand the extent to which healthcare in the United States is being run as a business. And that's fundamentally what's wrong with the healthcare financing system and fundamentally what's blocking us from getting universal healthcare. But in this graph, I've graphed the, num the growth in the number of physicians over the last few decades against the growth in the number of health administrators. And again, that's not a mistake on that y-axis. That's 2,500% increase in the number of administrators. Okay. Healthcare is increasingly becoming a spectator sport 
uh, where a tremendous amount of money is being taken up with case management, utilize, utilization reviewers, billing supervisors, insurance companies, discharge planners, a whole raft of paper pushers and administrators crowding out the doctors and nurses and physical therapists and home health aides who can actually provide the care to the patients. I've been studying the issue of administrative costs in medicine for more than a decade, um, and lest you think that the computers and the internet would make the problem of excessive paperwork in the healthcare system go away, I ran across this um, actually just a couple weeks ago. Uh, it was a study that I was looking at for another reason, and this was just in the methods section of the study where they were trying to look up the insurance coverage of 2,200 depressed people in Seattle. And to look it up, they had to look up 755 in different insurance plans for only 2,000 people. Obviously, a huge amount of complexity, redundancy, paperwork, huge amount of cost taken up in running a system on this basis. Okay. Now, the paperwork is a direct outgrowth of running healthcare as a business. Other nations do not run healthcare as a business, but the United States increasingly does. Currently, nearly two thirds of our HMOs are run on an investor owned, for profit basis. Only about 11% of our general hospitals, the place you'd go with your heart attack. Uh, but a much higher proportion of our psychiatric hospitals, nursing homes, home care, and dialysis are run uh, wholly as a for profit business. Um, I want to talk first about HMOs because I'm sure you all know that there's been huge growth in managed care and HMOs in the past couple of decades. Everybody knows that. But you're probably unaware that virtually all of the growth in HMOs has been in the investor-owned for-profit sector. The nonprofit sector in yellow along the bottom has more or less held its own, but essentially all of the growth has been in the blue part of the bars, the for-profit sector. So when we talk about HMOs in the year 2001, we're not talking about some consumer cooperative concept from the 60s or 70s. We're talking about HMOs as a way in which Wall Street has attempted to turn healthcare into a fully into a profit-making business. Okay. Now, what's the matter with that idea? I mean, I actually have some money that I've, I've got two kids and I've invested the money for my kids' education. And, you know, when I give my money to an investment company, I want them to make money for us. I mean, that's, the, that's what you invest for. Uh, but the question is, is that really the correct ethic for health care? Is there really a correct ethic that the only reason you're in business is to make as much money as possible? Uh, and I would say no. Um, I think it's quite usual in a business community to think about industrial espionage, trade secrets, confidentiality agreements, because that's the way businesses run. But is it really reasonable to think of healthcare in that way? Uh, and this is actually a Time Magazine article that came out several years ago after um, my husband and I uh, actually broke our gag clauses with Aetna US Healthcare by publishing our contracts in the New England Journal of Medicine. And uh, there was a big brouhaha. My husband was actually fired by the HMO. Uh, he had to go to the Phil Donahue show twice, and we were in Newsweek and Time Magazine. And uh, actually, Aetna US Healthcare was forced to rehire them and to temporarily rescind their gag clauses. Uh, within six months, those gag clauses were back in the contracts. And I have to tell you that I now have contracts probably with six or seven different HMOs. And every year I have to go through the contract because they're always trying to sneak gag clauses back in the contracts, even though they're illegal in the state of Massachusetts. Um, but why are there gag clauses? I mean, why would an HMO have to have doctors sign clauses promising not to talk about the HMO? Well, the dirty little secret of HMOs is you only make money taking care of healthy people. So if they get your $2,000 premium and they enroll you and you have no chronic illness, the average cost of caring for you is very low, less than 1000 bucks, and they're going to make money. But if you have even a minor illness like anxiety or arthritis, much less a serious issue like cancer or HIV, then the cost of your care is going to vastly exceed the premium amount. So the dirty little secret is that HMOs love healthy people and they hate sick people. Okay. And they, I have to be, tell you honestly, that I'm not going to show you any data on this, that there's a huge body of data showing that if you're basically a healthy person, you do just fine in an HMO. So if all you need is your pap smear, your cholesterol check, 
All the data shows you'll do fine in an HMO. But there's an equally large body of data that shows that if you get really sick, if you get in a car accident, if you get cancer, then the quality of care you'll get in the HMO setting is going to be substandard. Um, I was actually debating a fellow named John Gable on public television. And it, I have a videotape of this, which is a good thing because no one would believe me if I didn't have a videotape of this guy saying this. Now, Mr. Gable's actually a wonderful, excellent researcher and a very honest man. And I was presenting some of the data about the low quality of care received by HMO patients with chronic illness. And Mr. Gable stood up on public television and said, well, you know, that we at the HMO industry do a great job taking care of um, people who are healthy. We don't do a very good job taking care of people with chronic illness, but when we lick that problem, the HMOs will work just fine. <laughs> so, you know, a very honest guy, folks, you know, I'm sure the folks at the HMO industry who was representing weren't very happy about his honesty, but I think you'd be hard pressed to find anyone who's knowledgeable in the field of health policy who wouldn't agree with Mr. Gable. The problem with HMO care has been care of the chronically ill. Um, I just want to show you a little bit of the data about this. Um, there's, again, a huge body of data, probably 20 or 30 studies I could show you. Uh, you know, it's, it's after dinner and you can't really show 20 or 30 studies, but I'll show you two or three of the most important and most recent ones. Okay. Um, this is a study from South Florida that looked at Medicare HMO enrollment um, and it was able to get records of the people who enrolled in the HMOs. It was actually able to look at their health care the year before they enrolled in the HMO. And similarly, it was able to look at data after they disenrolled from the HMO. And I've graphed uh, the Medicare fee-for-service, the average amount of money that Medicare would spend on an average senior citizen in yellow at 100%. Okay. Turned out that the people who were recruited into the Medicare HMO in the year before they were recruited had health care costs that were only 66% of the Medicare average. And yet in the months after they disenrolled, they had health care costs nearly twice the Medicare average. What was going on? People were, the Medicare HMOs were selectively enrolling healthy seniors, and then when the seniors got sick, they were spitting them back out into traditional Medicare. Now, you might look at this and just think, well, gee, they're cheating the taxpayers. You know, the taxpayers are paying them to, to take care of the average senior citizen, and they're really only taking care of the healthy ones and spitting out the sick. And that would be bad enough that your and my tax dollars, and believe me, if you've ever worked a job that paid payroll tax, you're paying for Medicare. Okay, these are your tax dollars. That would be bad enough. But more serious is the question, well, what happened inside the HMO that made the seniors leave? And what happens to seniors who enroll in that HMO and are too sick or disabled to get out when they get sick? Uh, this is data from the medical outcome study that looked at senior citizens with chronic illnesses as well as a group of poor people with chronic illnesses who enrolled in HMO versus fee-for-service care. And at the top I've got the elderly up there, and elderly people enrolled in the HMO were much more likely to deteriorate, that's a big yellow bar coming to us, much more likely to deteriorate in their health than patients enrolled in fee-for-service. Uh, and similar finding among the poor people with a chronic condition. So in a very well done study, very carefully documented, patients in the HMO setting with a chronic condition were much more likely to deteriorate. Another recent piece of data. Uh, State of New York has been publishing for all hospitals that do heart surgery, for all hospitals that do heart surgery, they published the mortality rate. And the state of New York did that because they thought that if they published the mortality rate, all the people would send their business to the low mortality hospitals. Well, it turned out that HMOs were doing just the opposite, that the HMOs were selectively funneling their patients to the high mortality hospitals, presumably because the, the costs were lower at those hospitals. Okay. All right. Um, what about care of heart attack patients? I actually didn't realize Linda was going to tell her heart attack story, but uh, this is very apropos. Uh, again, very recent data about patients who had a heart attack. And I was talking to medical students this morning, so I apologize for a bit of the, the jargon here. But a class one indication 
a class one indication for an angiogram. An angiogram is a test that you get after a heart attack. They in inject dye and look at your arteries to see if your arteries are okay. And a class one indication means that a whole group of doctors who put together recommendations all agreed that you definitely needed the angiogram test. A class three indication would mean you didn't really need it in the first place. And it turned out that HMO patients were much less likely than fee-for-service patients to get this required test after a heart attack, um, particularly if they really needed it, those class one indications. Okay, uh, HMOs are denying access to emergency rooms to uh, black and white patients, 5% of all black patients, 2.5% of all white patients are denied emergency room visits every year in the United States. And stroke patients. Stroke is actually a very interesting paradigm for thinking about what happens to chronically ill people in the HMO setting because nothing will take you from being a healthy senior citizen to being a disabled person faster than a stroke. Um, so in this data about the rehabilitation care of people in stroke, found just what I've shown you in all the other slides in the HMO setting, people did not get the care they need. HMO setting in blue, people with stroke were less likely to get a rehab hospital care, less likely to get a neurologist to see them, less likely to get a physiatrist consult, which is a, to organize their physical therapy for them. Um, at one year, patients in the HMO setting were less likely to go home and more likely to end up in a nursing home. Okay. Now, why do I think this relates to the business orientation in medicine and what's my, my data saying that uh, for-profit ownership is worse than nonprofits. This is actually data that we published in the JAMA a couple of years ago, Journal of the American Medical Association. We were able to look at the majority of American HMOs, we report something called the HEDIS quality measures, uh, things like your rate of immuniz immunizing toddlers. There's 14 different HEDIS quality measures, and it turned out that the investor-owned HMOs had lower quality scores on all 14 of the quality measures. We think that's because of the high overhead that the HMOs generate. Cigna is, in fact, the market leader over here on the left. It's the HMO that's expanding, that's taking over other HMOs. Uh, Cigna, in, in the year of this uh, data, Cigna took a third of total premium dollars for overhead and profits, which meant that only 67 cents of every premium dollar was available for doctors, nurses, physical therapy, and home care. Uh, only, two, you know, only 67 cents on the dollar was there for care. And I'm kind of simplistic, and I think, well, if they've spent all their money on paperwork and profits and don't have money to care for patients, that's got to affect the quality, drive the quality down. And, of course, a, a lot of that um, spending is for uh, high executive salaries. Um, you wouldn't have much, time, much trouble paying off your student loans with those kinds of salaries. Okay. Okay. Now, I want to talk a little bit about the evidence about the profit orientation and other parts of the healthcare system. I've talked quite a bit about HMOs, but I want to talk a little about uh, for-profit hospitals. Again, this is some data that we published in the England Journal of Medicine. Uh, there's been two or three other studies since with the surprising finding that for-profit hospitals are actually more expensive than their nonprofit and public counterparts, quite a bit more expensive. Um, cost per patient stay was uh, $8,000 in this data year, more than in the nonprofits and public hospitals. It turned out that the higher costs in for-profit hospitals was not d due to clinical personnel like nurses, which I've shown in green, but to the yellow area that's all other costs, including their capital costs. Their capital costs were quite a bit higher, uh, and the blue area of administrative costs being higher in the for-profit sector. Moreover, uh, there's good data that the death rates are higher in for-profit hospitals. And again, this is one of three different studies that have looked at this. But the for-profit community hospitals have death rates about 7% higher than non-profit community hospitals and fully 25% higher than your major teaching hospitals. And of these three groups of hospitals, the for-profit community hospitals were, in fact, the most expensive costing more even in your major teaching hospitals. Okay. Um, just to drive home this point again, with the nursing home industry, 85% for profit, 
um, I'm sorry, 65% for profit. Uh, we were able to look at data on all U.S. nursing homes. These are the inspections that are done in the state. Every year a nursing home is inspected and a state inspector comes by and will issue something called a quality deficiency for quality problems. And a very good nursing home might have zero deficiencies. A very bad one might have a large number of deficiencies. And this is not a sample. This is all U.S. nursing homes we were able to look at. Uh, and it turned out the for-profit nursing homes were much lower quality and have a much higher rate of quality deficiencies. And again, I'm very simplistic, and I said, well, how can we explain this? Let's look at nursing hours per bed day. And I, indeed, the for-profit nursing homes had fewer nursing hours per bed day. So less nursing care, lower quality, a very simple kind of causal pathway, if you will. Okay. For-profit dialysis, 85% of dialysis for-profit. Turns out if you go to a for-profit dialysis center, center, your chances of dying are 17% higher than if you go to a non-profit center. And you're also less likely to be referred for a transplant because, because of course, if you get transplanted, the dialysis center loses your, their business. And again, this is a very good model for looking at this question because the rate of reimbursement for dialysis is fixed. The nonprofits and for-profit dialysis center get exactly the same reimbursement, exactly the same amount of money, and yet the quality is lower at the for-profit centers. Okay. So I think I've probably convinced you that there's something fundamentally wrong with a business-oriented healthcare system. Let's talk a little bit about what other nations do. Um, are there any people in the room who are from Canada? Any Canadians here? Someone back here? Any European citizens? There's a couple of Europeans. Well, you know what they do in other countries. Every other developed country has some form of national health insurance. So it may be a single payer system where the government actually provides the insurance for everyone. It may be a system where the government sets up a regulatory framework and you have multiple payers. But every other developed nation has universal health care. And Germany looks like they don't, but in fact, Germany says it, if your income's less than $100,000 a year, you have guaranteed health care. If it's more than $100,000, it's not guaranteed, but you can buy it on your, on your own. Um, so everyone else in the developed world has universal health care and a national health insurance model. And none of them, none of the other countries have relied on for-profit industry to deliver their health care. In other nations, the health care systems are government-assured, government-mandated, often uh, government-administered, uh, and always run on a non-profit basis. And I want to just remind you of the data I showed you earlier about the life expectancy, about the infant mortality, that the United States is really lagging behind the rest of the developed world in those important indicators of the quality of care. Now, you may be aware of the fact that the United States spends more than any other nation on Earth on health care. Despite all that I've told you about the problems in our health care system, the United States is really the high roller in health care. Um, and what I've done in this slide is something you're probably not used to seeing. Um, in blue, I've graphed the total health spending in other developed nations, so the total cost, public and private, of health care in other developed nations. Along the bottom, I've graphed the spending in the United States. The first thing you'll notice is that the United States spending is about double the average for other developed nations. But the other thing you'll notice is that I've divided health spending in the United States into public spending and private spending. And I've used a little bit of an uh, idiosyncratic definition of public spending. That is, in addition to counting direct government payments for health care like Medicaid and Medicare, I've also included the health benefit costs for government workers, because, of course, those are paid of our, out of our tax dollars. And I've also included the tax subsidy for private insurance. Now, what's the tax subsidy for private insurance? Because your employee benefits that you receive through your job are, ta are not taxed as income. There's a huge loss to the federal treasury. And while that sounds very abstract, it's actually very well recognized in tax and policy circles. And in fact, the figure for the tax subsidy to private insurance appears every year in the federal budget. 
It's approximately $116 billion this year, that figure from the federal budget. So I've put all of that into public spending. Um, and when you look at public spending in that way, as tax-supported spending, it turns out that public spending in the United States for health care exceeds total health spending in any other developed nation with the exception of Switzerland. So we're already, through our taxes, what we're paying in taxes now, we're already paying the full cost of a national health insurance system like they have anywhere else in the world. And then we turn around and pay privately an additional $1,400 a year in private spending in order to have this health care system that leaves 16% of the population with no insurance and many of the rest of us fighting with our HMOs to get the care that we've paid for. Um, now, how do we spend so much? As I've alluded to earlier, a bar large part of this is administrative costs, and I I've been working on administrative costs most of my professional career, um, but updated to the year 2000, over $800 per capita per year in excess administrative costs in the U.S. healthcare system. So for every one of us sitting in this room, those $800 spent on health administration in this country that would not be spent on healthcare paperwork if we had a national health insurance system like Canada's. Large part of the difference in health spending. Now what would a national health program for the United States look like? I work with an organization called Physicians for a National Health Program. Um, we have over um, almost 10,000, 9,700 physician members. And we're a single issue organization. The only issue we advocate around is a nonprofit national health insurance system for the United States. And a lot of people are kind of surprised when they hear that doctors are advocating for more government involvement in health care. And in fact, the editorial writer at the Berkshire Eagle newspaper made the joke, physicians for a national health program, that's a little like furriers for animal rights. Okay. Um, nonetheless, we're finding physicians are really so fed up with the healthcare system, so fed up with not being able to get the care that their patients need, that many of them are really rethinking their traditional opposition to government's role. But the type of national health program that we would advocate um, would be one that, that would cover everyone, that everyone would receive a health care card like a social security card that would assure care for all needed care without co-payments or deductibles. There would be complete free choice of doctor and hospital. You know, you go to Canada, you, if you're a Canadian citizen, you can go to any Canadian doctor you want. You go to Holland, you can go to any doctor you want. We're really alone in the developed world in restricting the doctors and hospitals that patients can go to. Doctors and hospitals would remain independent and nonprofit. They would negotiate their fees and budgets with the National Health Program. So instead of sending bills, hospitals would negotiate their budget and get their entire budget on a lump sum basis, one twelfth of that budget every month, wouldn't have to be sending bills. Um, there would be local planning boards to allocate expensive technology, so to decide how many MRI scanners we needed and where they should be. There would be progressive taxes that would go into a health care trust fund and progressive taxes simply means that rich people would pay more than poor people. Um, and without, it's, you can't really have a much of a discussion of tax policy after dinner, but I can tell you that the current way we finance health care has got poor people paying about three times as much of their income for health care as rich people. Okay. And you would have a public agency to process and pay the bills in order to get that administrative simplification, so it would be something like the Social, social Security Administration. Now, what's going on in other countries right now? Uh, if you've been in other countries, there's a lot of talk about privatization. Um, and in fact, part of what's going on is that the WTO and the people behind the WTO, the large hospital corporations, the large insurance corporations in the United States, have been pushing very hard to have the health systems of other nations opened up to investment by U.S. firms. And they've been pushing through the WTO and other organizations to open up the social insurance networks, the national health insurance networks in other countries. Um, so you'll see here in other countries a lot of talk 
about the need for privatization. A lot of that's motivated by corporations in the United States as well as small groups of affluent people in those countries. I can tell you that um, the national health insurance systems in the developing world are being very rapidly eroded by globalization. So if you go to South America or India, the national health insurance systems are really collapsing in the face of globalization. The same is not true in Canada and Western Europe. The, pop the populace has actually been resisting privatization and globalization, and despite a lot of debate going on, uh, privatization has been proceeding very slowly, and in some cases is being reversed in a lot of Western Europe. Okay. Um, what do the American people think? I mean, obviously, to get national health insurance, it's got to be something the American people want. It turns out a majority, really a vast majority of the American people, uh, support the idea that the government should provide quality medical coverage to all adults. But the closer you get to the centers of power, the less likely people are to support the idea of national health insurance. And, you know, I don't have national senators, and I, and I don't have the president, but I, I don't think he's in our... Uh, Support our bars, they're showing support. Um, the public hates the insurance industry. I mean, you'd be hard pressed to find somebody who likes the insurance industry. Even people who work in the insurance industry don't like the insurance industry. Okay. And some of you may have friends who work there, ask them what they think of the insurance industry. Um, but the, the health insurance industry and HMOs are down in the, in the basement of public dis esteem um, right there with tobacco and the proportion of people who think that the industry is doing a good job. And that's something relatively new. People used to like their health insurance 30 years ago. Okay. Um, what about the medical profession? Uh, this is some data uh, published in the New England Journal that looked at academic physicians. And by that, they mean medical students, interns and residents. Uh, academic faculty such as myself and academic deans at medical, medical schools, it turned out that 57% of uh, academic doctors now support single payer. Um, I think this is by and large the work of our group Physicians for a National Health Program. For whatever reasons, we've been stronger in the academic communities than elsewhere and have been working for years on this. I can tell you that we just did a survey of a random sample of doctors in my own state, Massachusetts. Um, it's a random sample generated for us by the AMA, and we're actually finding support for single payer in the state of Massachusetts among physicians is also in the uh, 60 to 65 percent range. Um, I can't really tell you what the situation is nationally, but I'm about to do a survey, and um, if I come back next year, you'll be able to find out what's happening with physician opinion um, more generally. Okay. Uh, this is our group, and I actually put this up here. Uh, for those of you who want more information, I know most of you are not physicians, but by going <coughs> to our website, you will be able to uh, connect with the organization, hear about work that's being done in the local area, including um, right here in Manhattan and right here in Kansas. Uh, I'd urge you to inform yourself and get involved. And right now, I'd urge you to stop and ask some questions. So um, we've got plenty of time for questions. So let's hear your ideas. And there's a gentleman right here. Yeah. You say you advocate the progressive tax yeah. in favor of the National Health Program. Uh -huh. Why progressive instead of flat rate? OK. Um, well, I'm a, I, OK. A progressive tax would be a tax like the income tax, where you pay more if you have more money. And a flat rate tax would be something like, um, what would that be like, just 10% of your income or something? Um, okay, that's actually tax policy and not health policy at some level. Um, so my support for that idea is, is in some ways unrelated to the rest. I just think that the wealthier people ought to pay more than poor people. I see a lot of people in my own practice whose illnesses are caused by poverty, and I think we need to be using the tax structure to try to fight poverty, and part of that means taxing wealthier people at a higher rate. But you're right, a flat rate tax could be used as well, and that would have the same effect. Over here. Oh, there's a mic, if, if you don't mind. If you, I'll, I'll repeat what you say, it's okay. What's your question, ma'am? Um, I'd like to understand the application that you use HMO and my patients and 
Okay, I'm sorry. I, we, we have a lot of jargon in the medical world, and um, I apologize for using it. HMO is Health Maintenance Organization, and that's this, um, this uh, type of managed care in this country where uh, your employer or you pay a set amount of money to the insurance organization in advance, and then um, they cover the cost of your care. And it's a much more restrictive form of insurance. The traditional insurance was you went wherever you wanted and got your care covered, where an HMO will often say you have to go to a certain number of doctors, you have to get your care approved in advance, there's only certain hospitals you can go to. Uh, MI, it means myocardial infarction, it's our jargon term for heart attack. And FFS is an abbreviation for fee-for-service, which is uh, the older way of paying for health care. But I apologize for that, and thank you for bringing that up. Yeah. Can we ask those of you who have a question to please come to the microphone so everybody can hear the question? It's yeah. really not that intimidating. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> or you can just raise your hand and shout if you really have to. I think we're re the part of the problem is we're recording this for later use, and if you don't come to the mic uh, and I forget to repeat your question, no one will, will ever know what was said. Okay. Yeah, ma'am? Okay. All right. Well, single payer is a term that we use for a particular type of national health insurance where there's a single government program that pays all health care bills. There's a single payer program in Canada. There's also a single payer program in Australia and some of the European programs are kind of hybrid single payer. Um, in Canada, every Canadian, from the richest Canadian to the poorest Canadian, has the same type of health insurance. Every age group, from the day you're born to the day you die, you have the same type of health insurance. There's one health plan in the province, and everyone has it. And it's illegal to sell insurance that competes with the, the health insurance in the province. So everyone's got the same health plan. And that's very good from an efficiency point of view, because you can shrink down your bureaucracy and have a very tiny bureaucracy. I, I, you remember I showed you that Cigna, one of the big HMOs, has got overhead costs of nearly 33%. That OHIP, the Ontario Health Insurance Plan, has overhead costs of less than 1%. So by going to a single plan, you can really get a lot of administrative savings. Plus, I think it's a much more fair situation if everybody's got the same health insurance. Next question. I'm aware that HMOs can put a provider in a terrible ethical bind. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, for that reason, I don't use them. I won't work with them anymore. But I, could you say anything about how the, uh, the European countries in Canada who have the government, do, what kind of possible ethical binds or not, how limited are physicians and other health care providers in what they can do if they think it needs to be done? Okay. Um, well, I'm sorry, are you a therapist, a psychotherapist? Yeah. Okay, I, I hear this a great deal from psychotherapists even in my own community because um, in order to get coverage for an HMO patient, you, for instance, have to give a lot of detail about the mental health issue. Um, often they'll tell you if you're going to, you can only treat the patient for four sessions. Um, and you think the patient's sicker, but they tell you if you, if you insist on more than four sessions, they're going to throw you off their list and you're not going to be able to treat patients from that HMO at all. So it, it is a horrible ethical bind that you, people get put into in the United States, uh, particularly when it comes to psychotherapy. Um, in Canada, if, if you're a therapist and you're seeing a patient, um, there's no limit on how often you can see them. There's no... Uh, the decisions actually made by the clinic that you're working at. Um, the, uh, so, so really it's an unlimited kind of psychotherapeutic situation. Similarly, uh, if you're a primary care doctor and feel you need to see a patient every week because of a problem, there's no limits placed on you. So I think uh, ethically you're in a much better situation. Um, in order to get payment for uh, psychiatric illness, all you have to do is write the diagnosis. You don't have to sit and give a lot of details about what the, what's going on with the patient. 
So I think from an ethical point of view, uh, it's actually quite a bit better in, in Canada and other European countries. I, I mean, the doctors there complain. They do have complaints about the system. Um, they complain that they'd like to have higher incomes. I mean, that's human nature. Everyone would like to have higher incomes. Um, they complain that there are limits placed on their technology. Um, while you can get all the technologies in Canada that you can get in this country, you can get MRI scans, you can get high-tech cardiac surgery, um, there's less, you know, you often have to drive to get the care. Uh, you may have to wait in a non-urgent situation to get the surgery. Uh, though you should be aware of just how short those waits are. You know, we hear a lot of publicity about waits in Canada. I mean, the newspapers in Boston never care anything about Canada unless it's a story about a waiting list, you know. Um, so you'd be very easy to get the impression that people are waiting all the time in Canada for everything. But when you've actually studied it, for cardiac surgery in Canada, for an urgent case, the wait's one day. For a non-urgent case, what we call an elective case, the average wait's 17 days. Is that bad? Yeah, it's bad. You shouldn't have to wait 17 days. Is that a major medical problem? No, of course not. Okay. I'll take the next question. You talked a lot about differences between uh, overhead costs just from administration. I was wondering what Europeans spend on overhead costs. Um, I've only seen a, one study that looked at overhead costs in other countries besides uh, Canada and Britain. I know Canada and Britain because I've developed some of the data on overhead costs in Canada and Britain. Um, but at one point, the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development tried to do a study looking at overhead costs. And it did look like, like countries like Germany, where they have multiple payers, even though it's sort of mandated by the government, regulated by the government, they have multiple insurance plans, that their overhead costs were relatively high. Not as high as the United States, but they were relatively high. Whereas those that had really single payer systems, uh, like Canada, Britain, Australia had had lower costs. I actually had uh, two questions. The first was, uh, would the, in your idea for a single payer plan, would there be an option for a single person to perhaps opt out of the service and go with another insurance company, uh, which would also be related to uh, in the idea that there could actually exist other insurance companies, which I wasn't sure whether you supported or not. Okay. And then my second question was, uh, I read somewhere a while back, and I'm not sure where it was, but I read somewhere that there was a man who, who was frequently abusing the healthcare system in that he would uh, go into a hospital and report chest pains of some sort, and he actually felt the chest pains, but it was more of a psychological type of... Uh, uh, more of a psychological thing and they were required to treat him because of some certain mandate and I was wondering how your organization would address that type of abuse. Okay. Um, okay, first the question is would we allow competing private insurance? No, a single payer system would outlaw competing private insurance. You have to do that if you want everybody in the same plan. I, when people first hear it, they go, oh my God, that's so un-American. How could you outlaw competing private insurance? However, Medicare has got the same rule. It's illegal in this country to sell insurance that competes with Medicare. <laughs> okay? So what we're saying is that for everyone at all age groups, we need to develop a government-funded plan like Medicare, only better. Uh, and then to do that, you need to outlaw competing private insurance. If in Canada, they do have private insurance, but it only covers the things that are not covered by the national health insurance. So you can get insurance that will cover uh, eyeglasses, uh, things like that. Some of the some of the uh, provinces do not have long-term care; some do. So you can get coverage for long-term care if it's not covered. But anything that's covered by the single-payer plan, you have to ban competing private insurance in other in order to get those administrative savings. And I'll tell you why. I mean, my hospital, I, I work at a small hospital. We only have 150 beds open right now. We have 75 people in our fiscal department sending bills. And if we could go to a single payer system, we could get that down to maybe two or three people sending bills. But if there's the single payer and then 
other private insurance companies, then we've still got to have that billing department and keep all those administrative personnel there. So it's really pretty important for to get those administrative savings to to ban the uh, competing private insurers. In terms of abuse of the system, there's a lot of talk about the patients who abuse the system and. We as doctors find them very annoying. I mean, I have a couple in my practice who show up every two weeks with a different complaint. Um, but when you look at the cost of care for that type of patient, it's just it's a tiny fraction of health care costs. I mean, the lady, who, the lady who shows up in my clinic once every two weeks, we just sit and talk for 10 minutes, and I reassure her, and she goes home. So if you deal with those people, and similarly, someone who shows up in the emergency room with, a, with chest pain, if you can reassure that person and send them home, um, they're not going to be a huge cost burden on the system. Um, those people have a disease. It's called hypochondriasis. And you can manage it without too much expense. Um, they're really not the cost drivers in the healthcare system. The cost drivers are things like administrative costs. The cost drivers are things like excessive use of technology. Um, and I say excessive because I'm an internal medicine specialist. I love technology. I mean, I, I, you know, we, we work with technology all the time. I love new pharmaceuticals. Or, you know, they do wonderful things, but they're totally overused. And that's when the high costs come in, is when you take a good technology and overuse it for people who don't need it. Uh, next question. So why don't you come on, step down so you can get on the videotape in case yeah. someone shows up tomorrow at the library and wants to hear what you said. Uh, but we know that the insurance companies are very powerful uh -huh. politically. And I'm just wondering uh, politically how you would plan to get to a single payer system. Okay. Um, well, the insurance companies are certainly powerful, but we do, in fact, live in a democracy. And the congressmen and senators uh, have to be elected. Okay? And actually, what happened with the Clinton health plan was there was a period in the early 90s when you could win and lose elections over the issue of national health insurance. And uh, many of you are too young to remember what happened with Harris Wofford in the state of Pennsylvania, but it was actually somewhat serendipitous in that a uh, seat opened up and a very popular Republican governor named Thornburg was running for the Senate seat. Um, and Harris Wofford was running. He was the underdog. And the Thornburg people did this incredibly stupid thing. The last three weeks of the election, they took out TV ads all over the state saying that Wofford supported single payer health insurance. And don't vote for this guy, he supports single payer. And Wofford won the election. And it was like this thunderbolt coming from the sky, and everyone got religion all of a sudden. And all over Washington, they were talking about national health insurance. And, it, you know, the, the Clinton debacle kind of cooled that. but. You can go from a situation where there's no discussion in national health insurance to a situation where it's everywhere on everyone's lips almost overnight if it becomes obvious to the liberal wing of the Democratic Party, and that's who's likely to become obvious to, that you can win or lose elections on that basis. So things can change very quickly. Um, I think we are going to see a reemergence of this issue because people will be losing their jobs, losing their health insurance. Even people who have steady jobs, like myself, we're going to be getting a lot of pressure from our employers as they attempt to cut back their contribution to health insurance. This issue is going to emerge again in the next few years, and we need to be ready with the citizens' movement to assert the need for national health insurance. First, a comment about um, the German system, which opposes, I think, what you said about the not having um, conflicting or alternatives is that I think the German system has the public health insurance, but people that don't want to buy or what or don't that aren't offered that can buy their own private insurance, as you alluded. And then there's a complaint within that system that um, those that do get the private insurance get better care and can select than the than the non-private health insurance. But then my question is, I I, I come up against a lot of um, criticisms 
by physicians primarily, and I'm wondering how you feel about this, that, um, you know, we don't want a system like Medicare. Medicare, it, you know, reimburses poorly. We have to fight with them all the time. Um, and they, you call the, the central agency, you always talk to somebody different, you don't get a straight answer, they tell you different things. How, would a, how could we improve upon the Medicare system and convince the physicians in general that it could in fact work? Okay. Um, well, I think what you're saying about Germany is generally true. Germany, I, I tend not to talk about a German model very much because uh, the reason is that they have an institutional basis for a healthcare system in Germany that we don't have. That is, most of the insurance is run, organized around something called sickness funds, and sickness funds are jointly managed by the employers and the unions. And most people get their health care through a sickness fund. Now, why wouldn't that work in the United States? Because most American workers are not unionized. So this sort of quasi-public joint employer union way of organizing things is not really viable in the United States. But I think you are, you are correct in that there's a bunch of different types of insurance plans, and particularly the small sh proportion of people who buy private insurance, it reimburses the doctors a little bit more, and presumably the reason they buy it is they think they're going to get a little bit better. Okay. Uh, not an ideal system, even if it were ideal, we don't have the institutional basis here uh, that would allow us to do this. Uh, the second part of your question had to do with the Medicare program. The Medicare program is far from perfect. Um, the biggest problem with it from my point of view is it doesn't cover enough so that senior citizens have Medicare. They take a big sigh of relief when they turn 65. Whew, I've got Medicare. Finally, I've got insurance. And then they find there's so much stuff that their Medicare just doesn't cover. And as you saw at the end of life care, most of those people at the end of life uh, did have Medicare. Uh, lots of things aren't covered, and you can end up with a lot of financial hardship. So that's my biggest problem with it. I know a lot of physicians complain about Medicare regulations. I want to tell you we don't complain in the state of Massachusetts because Medicare currently pays faster and at, least, and at an equal or higher rate to HMOs in our state. So we don't do a lot of complaining in Massachusetts, but I know other parts of the country people do. Okay. I have another question. Uh, the Catholic Church has a lot of hospitals in America. How would a single-payer system work with offering different types of care that Catholic hospitals do not offer? Okay. Um, well, the Catholic uh, church-run hospitals could continue to be church-run hospitals in a national health insurance system. Um, we we would not allow for-profit hospitals, and we basically force the for-profit hospitals to convert back to nonprofit status. Many of them were nonprofit up until recently and converted to for-profit, and we force them to convert back. But nonprofit hospitals like Catholic hospitals or Jewish hospitals or Lutheran hospitals could continue to participate. And in fact, uh, in if you go to Canada, there's lots of religious hospitals, particularly in Quebec. Um, they can still have the nuns or the rabbis or whatever, you know, whatever they have that makes them special for the patients who go to religious hospitals. But the hospital would get their entire budget from the national health insurance system on a lump sum basis. I guess I've read some articles where uh, mm -hmm. certain areas are, just because of the how we've become more for-profit, that certain areas are being ruled completely by a Catholic hospital so that uh, morning after pills and things like that aren't available to the entire population around that area. Would, okay. would there be sort of a, a different funding system to also have a, a separate hospital for, for other people or we just centralize it all on whatever's there? Okay, and okay well, um, you're getting around to you know, what is actually a drawback in having a national health insurance system, which is you kind of politicize some of these decisions, um, but my guess about what would happen realistically is that the Catholic hospitals would continue to do what they do, which is not provide abortion services, for instance, and the other hospitals would continue to do what they do, which is to provide them very quietly so as to avoid having Molotov cocktails and gunshots come through their windows. Um, but that's my guess about what would happen. Follow up on the question he just uh, asked you prior to that. 
when you said that you would force the for-profit institutions to go back to non-profit, right. what are you going to do with the standalone surgery centers, the many, many standalone mm -hmm. dialysis centers, the mm -hmm. many, many, many standalone open MIR centers? Is the government going to go around and buy these private investors out for um, dollar for dollar at the profits that they're making? Some of those centers are making 400% profit versus if it was being run by a non-profit organization. How are you going to take care of those kind of people? Um, well, uh, certainly you can transform a for-profit hospital back to non-profit status. Over the last five years, 75 hospitals in the United States have gone from being for-profit to being non-profit or public. Okay. So that happens all the time. That's not that big a deal. And there's ways you figure out how to reimburse people. You don't, you reimburse them based on the money that they put in. You don't reimburse them based on some 400% uh, rate of profit that they can project. And there's a whole, you know, fair way of doing that. The government does have to take private property from time to time. For instance, when the Tennessee Valley Authority was set up, in the Tennessee Valley, they bought out 35 um, private electric companies in order to do the Tennessee Valley Authority. You can't seize someone's property and not reimburse them, but you reimburse them based on the money they put in and not based on some theoretical extravagant rate of profit. So it, it would be a big transition, but the, we do know how to do this legally. We know how to do it financially. It's not impossible. Let it, yeah. I think I'm going to cut the questions off now. Uh, thank you all for coming very much. And you are all invited to come upstairs to the Sunflower Room for a reception where you can consider, continue your conversations with Steffi. Thanks so much for being here. <laughs>